。本期视频是两位外国学者在播客中讨论，为什么中国科技发展如此迅猛？结论是中国是世界上最注重 STEM 学科建设的国家。称赞中国人高瞻远瞩、厚积薄发的同时，也嘲笑了部分外国人仍然戴着有色眼镜看中国，只活在自己想象的世界里。我们来看看他们是怎么说的吧。If I follow the Western media today, they tell me China is collapsing. If I turn on Gabacal, I learn. Wait a minute. Their monthly trade surplus is 80 billion. It's, it's on an annualized run rate. It's a trillion dollar trade surplus. If I turn into Steve Shu's, tune into Steve Shu's podcast, who's interviewing technologists and scientists, I learn that in space, semiconductors,、uh, jet engines, electric vehicles, solar panels, they're at parity or beyond parity with the West now in all those areas. So, who has the story right?、Um, well, Steve Shu definitely has the story right. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me let me just say.、Um, So one of my favorite philosophers,、uh, a, a Christian philosopher of the 16th century, a guy called Jean Baudin, who would say, "The only wealth is man.、Uh, the only wealth is people."、Um, now, when I studied in China in、uh, the early 90s, China was graduating 300,000 university students a year.、Uh, today, China graduates this year. Sorry, last year it's graduated 11 and a half million, and this year it's going to graduate about 12.3 million people.、Uh, That's a 30x in one generation. Yep. In terms of, in going going to your point about you know the progress made on semiconductors, the progress made on space, on computers, etc.、Um, you know, China now graduates every year more engineers than there are in the United States. Than there are engineers in the United States. Now, we could debate all day. Yes, but the Chinese universities don't have the same levels as the U.S. universities, and we're, we're comparing apples and oranges, etc. But The point I'd make is, 30 years ago, you were graduating 300,000 guys, and even if the 12 million guys you're now graduating are not the same level as your 12 million guys from the University of Michigan or the the you know Harvard that you mentioned or Duke or etc.,、um, that's still a whole lot better than plowing fields with、uh, behind a horse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the. Sorry,、uh, sorry. I, I was going to say I've been a professor for, for 30 years, and so I've seen the whole arc of what you describe. Where at the beginning, if you wanted to get a world class science education, at least at the graduate level, you had to leave China and come out here. There were no world class research labs in China. Fast forward to today, there are many Chinese universities with top flight departments across the board in STEM subjects, and. About twice the fraction of kids of that 11 million that you described, the percentage that they're doing STEM is twice as high as in the United States. So overall, you just get this enormous tidal wave of human capital that's feeding into their system, and their, their K through 12 grads are pretty good. So basically, now they can get all the way up to world class frontier, you know, research level training at their domestic universities, which even 10 years ago they couldn't do that, but now they can. So the That、all this stuff is compounding. You can just see it in how young the teams are over there that are doing this world-class work, whether it's in jet engines or satellites or computers. So、um, that that human capital thing is for real. It's not going to go away for decades. So on this, so I, I completely agree with you. But if if I was the U.S., perhaps one worrying statistic is if you take the the, the very best Chinese universities, your Beida, your Tsinghua, your Fudan. Uh, Yanan does.、Um, they used to send a lot of university graduates、uh, to the U.S.、Uh, so you do their undergrads there, and then to your point, you'd come to Michigan to do a master's or a Ph.D. in you know physics or chemistry or whatever.、Um, those numbers have been in freefall.、Uh, now, initially, you thought, okay, it's COVID. You know, like nobody's moving. It's hard to 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 get out of the country, etc. But even post COVID, there's been no rebound.、Um, now you could say, well, it's the economic difficulties in China, or or、uh, it's actually I can now do a very good PhD in chemistry at Tsinghua,、uh, which I think is actually what it is. I don't need to spend all this money、yeah. to go to 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 go. If I'm a top top guy, I don't need to spend all this money to go to Michigan. I can go to Tsinghua. You know,、um, you know, Louis, you yeah, you went through the pain of having to learn Mandarin.、Right? So 
imagine how painful it would have been for you at 22 to say, oh my God, the only place I can do my PhD in material science is at Tsinghua. And now I got to be fully fluent. I got to read all my textbooks in Mandarin. I got yes. to network with my job recruiter in Mandarin. I got to do everything in Mandarin. There are plenty of people in China that are great scientists, but their English isn't that great. So why would they come here, right? It's such a burden for them to come here that they can, if there is an ecosystem for them to develop their skills and to practice what they learned in school in China, they're obviously going to favor that once, once the system is mature. So, and, and so I think to your point, I think we're, we've reached that point in China now. Um, and I think that that's a change that we perhaps underestimate we in the Western world underestimate because we just take it for granted that we have the best universities in the world. Uh, and that of course, if you're smart, you want to go to Harvard. And of course, once you're in Harvard, you're never going to move back to China because why would you? Yeah. Um, and and that was because, in fairness, that was always the case for a hundred years, or for at least the post World War II environment. That was the case, and I don't know if it still is. I don't know if it's still the case in the, the past. I think five, it's. Six I years. think it's. It's just tipping now. So and 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 obviously for the bulk of students who aren't necessarily they don't necessarily have the choice of going to Stanford or Tsinghua. But it's some other good Chinese university and then some other, you know, reasonably good U.S. university. I think more they're much more likely to stay in China now than they certainly than they were even a few years ago. I think the, China's in a in a transition phase and looks, you know, I, things being very vocal about, you know, wanting to obviously push technology really hard. We talked about all this, the kids moving into STEM, et cetera, um, about how wealth creation has to come from. Uh, for, you know, beefing up tech, beefing up industry, beefing up manufacturing, beefing up China's exports. Um, and in the past five years, China's done remarkably well in that space, actually. Um, when you think of it, China's had to endure uh, a couple things. Well, it's had to endure a real estate bust. It's had to endure a yen at 150. You know, Japan. Japan is one of the biggest industrial powerhouses in yep. the world. Yep. And it's got it's got a currency that is just stupidly, stupidly undervalued. You know, I was I was in Japan a few months ago. Um, you go. It used to be that if you wanted to go out for dinner in Tokyo, you had to get a second mortgage on your house. It was like so expensive. Uh, now Tokyo is the most the, the cheapest. Yeah, it's like a developing country. <laughs> it's the cheap. I mean, you go for lunch in Tokyo. Like a really nice lunch, it's going to cost you fifteen bucks. I think. Um, I think quality adjusted. The, the you know eating out, dining out in say Tokyo or anywhere in Japan is like got to be the best deal in the world right now because you have the the highest quality no levels about it. and the prices are way down because of the yen. At least if you're an American, it's, no, uh, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Look, I think you wanted to say that the the manufacturers and high tech companies in China are competing against a very weak yen, yet they're yeah. taking market share. Uh, have huge trade surpluses, and so it's obviously exactly for anybody else to try to compete with at Japan is is extremely hard. And the fact that they can do it tells you something, right? So exactly. Uh, so when you think of it, they've had to deal with a super cheap yen, um, uh, the real estate bust we mentioned, and on top of that, the American um, um, war uh, <laughs> restrictions on CMI. Well, yeah, war, war. for any like, but CMI, you know, CMI conductor restrictions and 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 whatever else, and with that, from nowhere five years ago, China's become the biggest car exporter in the world. Like, if you had told me the yen would be at 150, I would say every car in the world is going to be produced in Japan. Yep. But we're moving into a world where every car in the world is going to be produced in China. Yep. Because not only are they good at producing cheap internal combustion engine cars, but they've basically, at this point, they've cornered the electric car market. Um, and, and Europe is, is waking up to this. Because Europe was saying, oh, you know, by 2030, we want every new car sold to be to be electric. And they're realizing, oh, hold on, if we do that, that means that we want every new car sold to be Chinese. Um, and, you know, which, you know, creates issues. Um, so, but beyond electric cars, you got railways, you got power plants, turbines. I mean, you name it, you know, five years ago. You mentioned that China's trade surplus has gone from 25 billion a month to 75 or 80 billion a month. Uh, and again, that's not because you and I decided to buy three times as many pairs of socks or three times as many, you know, plastic toys. Yep. Um, you know, in the past five years, China started exporting a bunch of stuff they never exported before. 
Um, you know, right now, China's in negotiations with Saudi Arabia to sell Saudi Arabia nuclear power plants. Now, as a Frenchman, I look at this and I wonder what the hell just happened here? Like selling nuclear power plants is our, our business. You know, that's what, that's what we do in France. That's like one of our key comparative advantages. And China comes in and undercuts us by two thirds. Um, sorry, they come in at two thirds of our price. Um, so undercut us by one third. It's, it's mind blowing. Um, and, you know, building cars, building nuclear power plants, uh, building railroads, that's complicated stuff, yep. right? I mean, it's again, it's not plastic toys anymore. You know, when, uh, I, when, I, when I talk to Americans, uh, a lot of the most anti-China people, they want to say, okay, this is all stolen. You guys stole all this IP and technology. And I'm sure some of that happened. But even if you stole stuff without a very powerful human capital and tech infrastructure basis, you're not going to be able to compete across all these different industries going forward. If, if all they did was steal and you stop them from stealing, you're going to get back ahead of them. But it looks the other way. It looks like they're getting ahead of us now. So um, very okay, different so what, from how what it's did, perceived here. All right. So go ahead. I hate the stealing of IP argument, to be honest. Uh, I, I, uh, it's sort of one of my bugbears. I always say, okay, look, China's become the biggest EV producer in the world. Like, what did they steal from whom? Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, you know. Yeah, Tesla uh, buys their like batteries this, from them, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tesla buys their. It's like who, who did they steal and from whom to 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 do this? Uh, now you could say they stole it from Tesla, but actually, Tesla early on in its uh, uh, life said, "I'm putting all all everything up there on the web, everything we've done, and anybody can look at it because we want the world to move to an electric car format." Um, like, you know, who did who did they steal to do this? Um, you know, nuclear power plants, they build their own nuclear program from, from scratch. Like this is, you know, everybody have, it's really hard to steal nuclear stuff because of all the national security around it, et cetera. So like if, if we want to say China stole the nuclear secrets, um, then that means that we've got some serious espion, like espionage leaks yeah. going on in our own countries. I uh, to be honest, when I talk to people like that, I don't even want to fight that battle. I'll just say, look, let, let's, <laughs> let's, let's suppose they stole everything, but they have very competent people making use of what they stole. And going forward, just crying about it is not going to solve your problem because they're innovating new stuff, as with EVs, as you pointed out, right? So, or, or LIDAR but or something. It, it, yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying a little while ago. It's like, look, if China produces more engineers every year than there are engineers in the U.S., um, how can we not expect to eventually be bypassed? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, to say, oh, they're just stealing stuff. It's like, so what are all these people doing? Like, you know, these literally yeah. millions of engineers yeah. that are getting churned out every year. Yeah. If you're um, if, if you're a technologist, like a Silicon Valley guy or an academic scientist, and you've just been over there and you've interacted with people, you realize that they're sharp. You realize they're comparable. The graduates from their schools are comparable to the grad or better than the graduates from Western schools. So um, have, you pretty quickly realize. Well, fairness, still, yeah. The graduates. So my younger, my, uh, my, uh, I've got a young niece who's currently doing a, a PhD in, um, in biomedical engineering at uh, Imperial College in, in London. She's, she's really bright. Um, she's the hope of our family, et cetera. You know, we, we all believe she's, we all believe she's going to cure cancer. Um, she's, she's terrific, but, half of the people doing imperial at, at, uh, are chinese <laughs> like yeah. half of the people at imperial college which is like a, a stem based school in in the us yep. are chinese and the half that's not chinese is indian yep by the way when we we count oh you know all the stem people <laughs> like china produces more than there are in the us etc we also have to count that the ones being produced in the us a lot of them are going to go back to china anyway yep um yep we we've we have undervalued stem in our schooling system, not at the university level, but from from a much earlier age. Absolutely. Uh, so that when kids kids come in at university, most don't even look at STEM. Yeah. They just like blow right past. The only thing that kids still look at is computer sciences. Yep. Exactly. But how many how many of our kids still do chemistry or physics or you know you mentioned material sciences or all these things like nobody yeah. does. Don't, don't get me started on this because, um, you know, most U.S. universities actually, they used to have an algebra two requirement. So this is like high school level algebra uh, that you had to have mastery of that to get your bachelor's degree. 
And they dropped that because so few students or so many students on campus were having trouble passing that kind of remedial math class. They just waived the requirement now. So, so it is really a problem here in the United States. Um, you know, this is, would not be the case at Duke, but at many public universities, it really is an issue. It's an impediment to graduation to require them to have some basic knowledge of math and, and science. So, but remember, um, rem remember, they steal our secrets. Yeah, exactly. Um, so <laughs> we can't, we can't pass maths, but they come and steal our secrets. <laughs>